Good evening. I'm Allison McFarland. I'm director of the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs here at UBC. And tonight, it is my immense pleasure to welcome you all to our first event in the 2024 Phil Lind Initiative Speakers Series on pop culture and political life in the United States. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. We're delighted you're here, and I invite you to check out our previous programming, which is online. And for those of you who've attended in the past, welcome back. We hope you're as excited as we are about this year's upcoming program. Before we kick this series off this year, however, I'd like uh, a few points to touch on. The first, of course, is an acknowledgement that all of us who are gathered here today in this beautiful corner of the world are on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded lands of the Musqueam peoples. And since a number of you are joining us online, I invite you to reflect on the indigenous lands where you're located and what it means to be situated there. Secondly, I want to extend an enormous thank you to the Chan Center for partnering with us this year. We are so thrilled to be able to host all of our Lind events this year in this beautiful venue. I also wanted to thank the UBC Opera, who have graciously relinquished their stage <laughs> for the evening so we can all be here tonight. And this year's show is Cinderella or Cendrillon, and I invite you to check it out. And lastly, it's with a very heavy heart that we take a, a moment to acknowledge the passing of the visionary person behind this initiative, Phil Lind. You may have seen some of the slides in the lobby before you came in here this evening. We had photos of him. I had the pleasure of working with Phil for the past years, and I really appreciated his wisdom and his wit. It feels impossible to find the words to adequately give voice to Phil's achievements or to mention Phil's boundless curiosity, his commitment to fostering critical dialogue, or his unwavering commitment to younger generations, because that would seem to leave out so much else. But such is the difficulty of trying to honor a man who had so many passions and whose life touched so many. A life led with such energy has left an indelible mark on the intellectual landscape of both this university and the broader community. I'll end by offering this reflection. We're all able to gather here tonight in the spirit of curiosity and learning because of Phil's generosity and vision. For that, I, on behalf of the Lind Initiative and the broader UBC community, am immensely grateful. Thank you, Phil. So turning now to this evening's program, it's my immense pleasure to kick off this season of the Phil Lynn Speaker Series, in which we explore the intersection of pop culture and politics. Over the next four months, we will ask if the pop culture helps or hinders our understanding of political life in the United States today, and what role, if any, it plays in shaping or subverting political realities. And while our guests are invited specifically to speak on the American experience, if our previous seasons are any guide, we will all leave here tonight with much that we can use to reflect upon our experience here in Canada as well. Before I introduce the moderator and speaker for tonight, a few quick logistical notes. We'll be taking audience questions, as we usually do, uh, in the latter part of the event through Slido, so, getting your handy phone out, simply visit slido.com and enter the code hashtag LindSlido. That's all one word. And there it is, if you can see it on this tiny screen. Um, <clears throat> 
and input your question. And you are um, welcome to submit your questions, to upvote questions that are already there that you'd like to hear asked by the moderator. And if you are on X, formerly known as Twitter, please feel free to tweet along with the event using the hashtag LIND24. And lastly, just a friendly reminder to silence your cell phones. With that, I'm delighted to be able to introduce our moderator for this evening, Dr. Kimberly Bain, an assistant professor in the Department of English Language and Literatures. Her work centers on questions of the histories, theories, aesthetics, and philosophies of the African diaspora. Her writing has appeared in numerous publications, and she has two books forthcoming on black breath and black alchemy, dirt, soil, and other dark matter. Perhaps most important of all to mention here, however, is that Dr. Bain is the co-instructor of this year's LIND Initiative Seminar, a graduate course that parallels this speaker series, along with Dr. Christopher Patterson. Next, I am beyond excited to introduce our keynote speaker for tonight, Gia Tolentino. A critically acclaimed writer, Gia is an incisive observer of the constructs and consequences of the age of social media, reality television, and our hyper-digital society. She's currently staff writer for The New Yorker, but has enjoyed a distinguished career that includes stints as deputy editor at Jezebel, and as contributing editor at The Hairpin. A New York Times best-selling author, Gia has also been awarded the Whiting Award as well as the Jeanette Hyen Ballard Prize. Tonight, Gia will share with us a talk entitled, Who's Afraid of Eating the Rich? Which promises to stimulate a rich conversation at the intersection of inequality and popular culture. And what a perfect backdrop for such a conversation. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Gia Tolentino. I'm sorry that I did that. <laughs> I just felt like I had to, and you know, I, I, I am Cinderella herself. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, thank you to UBC for having me. It feels a little churlish to be talking about Eat the Rich at an event that's so generously furnished by donor money and that has allowed me to spend an extremely peaceful day at a really beautiful hotel downtown, but nonetheless, here we are. Um, I also want to say before I start, I'm Canadian. I was born in Toronto. My great-grandmother lived in Vancouver, so it's nice to be home. <laughs> Okay, so recently I was watching the movie Fair Play, which is about a young straight couple, both of whom work at a hedge fund. Shortly after they get engaged, one of them gets a promotion that the other one expected, and then their relationship implodes. Of course, you don't need me to tell you which gender plays which role in the plot here. When it was over, my husband said he really didn't like it, and I was like, damn, <laughs> not the man I live with being triggered by a movie about male fragility. <laughs> I was like, why didn't you like it? And he's, he said, I'm just tired of this. I said, tired of what? And he said, I'm tired of every movie and TV show just being about really rich people. And he was pretty much right on this point. Embarrassingly, I'd kind of forgotten to notice because Hollywood has been primarily depicting the wealthy for most of our lives. It wasn't always this way. Mainstream pop culture used to center the working class with some frequency. There was The Honeymooners, which began airing in 1955. It was about a bus driver in Brooklyn. All in the Family featured Archie Bunker, a dock hand in Astoria. Roseanne in the late 80s and 90s. Uh, she was a factory worker, a telemarketer, a cashier, a janitor, all kinds of things. At the movies, we had Norma Ray in 1979 with Sally Field playing a textile worker, Silkwood in 1983 with Meryl Streep working at a chemical plant, even Aaron Brockovich, Brockovich, Brockovich in 2000 with Julia Roberts playing a broke paralegal, all of these being heavily institutionally rewarded middle brow hits. Today we still have TV shows and movies about people who struggle with money, but they tend to be 
Exceptions like Moonlight notwithstanding, Out of the Spotlight, Underappreciated, Prematurely Cancelled. TV has mostly remained on the trajectory set by Friends, Will and Grace, Modern Family, Transparent, shows where money is never a real issue, economic structures are basically invisible. And the same goes for shows even that are about, explicitly about conspicuous consumption, like Sex and the City, Gossip Girl, Big Little Lies. And at the movies, in fact, the biggest recent trend involves the complete sidestepping of all reality. Of the top 50 highest grossing films of the 2010s, only one of them was not a superhero franchise, a sci-fi franchise, a fantasy franchise, or a movie for kids. About 40% of American adults struggle to make ends meet every month, but this near half of the population has disappeared from pop culture over the course of the last few decades, decades during which, as we know, income inequality has steadily increased. In 1989, the richest 5% of American families had 114 times as much wealth as poorer families in the second quintile. By 2016, this figure was 248 times as much. The invisible welfare state, the one that benefits upper middle and upper class Americans, has greatly expanded. Currently, mostly through tax subsidies, the average household in the top quintile of income receives about $10,000 more per year in benefits than households in the bottom quintile. Today, 10 million children in America live without food security. The richest 10% of the country holds nearly three quarters of the wealth. The richest 1% owns more than a third. And the funny thing is that this reality, kind of, the reality of the extreme disproportionate wealth held by a really small group of people, this has worked its way into pop culture. Poor or even tru truly middle class people, whatever that means, remains, remain basically invisible. But we currently have, in the form of class war TV and cinema, a lot of luxury depicted with a slant of critique. 2019 brought the first Knives Out about a family battling over a large inheritance, which ends up passing to a lowly and very hot home health aide. There was Hustlers that year about a group of strippers who robbed investment bankers in pre-recession New York. And there was Parasite about a poor family that infiltrates a rich family's home in Seoul. In 2021 and 2022, there was so much eat the rich content as the term now goes that it got a little cliche, right? The second Knives Out featured a bunch of rich star fuckers having meltdowns on a private island owned by a tech billionaire. Both seasons of White Lotus featured 1% vacationers working through their psychological issues at the expense of working class staff at the five star resorts they stayed at. Triangle of Sadness told the story of a disastrous luxury cruise which flooded with literal excrement and then stranded its surviving passengers on an island to be ruled by the former head of the cleaning staff. In the menu, a soulless group of gastro tourists who paid $1,250 for a single meal ended up getting murdered by the chef. And finally, one of the backbeats of Succession 2 was the existential and moral rot that comes as an unwritten amenity of private jets and palatial homes. It was very timely stuff in terms of American politics. Bernie Sanders, proud socialist, won Nevada in the 2020 primary, running on a proposal that would raise taxes on the 180,000 households with a net worth above 32 million. Sanders wanted to cut the wealth of the typical billionaire in half over 15 years, and to use that money to fund national rent control, universal child care, and Medicare for all. Elizabeth Warren also put a wealth tax at the center of her campaign platform. She called, she called for higher taxes on households with a net worth above 50 million. And during the first months of the pandemic, even under Donald Trump, we had a season of something that pointed towards something like socialism, with a massive COVID relief package that extended unemployment benefits, banned most evictions, and instantly cut child poverty in half. But then standard practices took back over. Joe Biden, a centrist who had rejected the idea of a wealth tax as divisive and unrealistic, won the nomination, then the presidency. Over the course of the pandemic, billionaires increased their wealth by 62%. Almost two-thirds of all new wealth created from 2020 to the present has gone to the top 1% of household. households. So I was just wondering, what did this pop cultural turn towards eat the rich ideology mean in this context? Was it a solidification of some underlying collective political instinct? Was it a release valve, a convenient one, for a sense of economic injustice that both parties pay vague lip service to but fundamentally ignore? I wondered, what does it mean that some of the wealthiest people in America are making, watching, and profiting from movies about how wealth is corrosive? 
What is the nature of the recognition felt by the privileged viewer when we watch these things? Is it something like when Barack Obama, who oversaw 563 drone strikes over his two terms, put Oppenheimer on his list of favorite movies of the year? In the words of Mark Fisher, what if you held a protest and everybody came? I had one idea to start about what's going on, and it has to do with how these movies and TV shows present what it is to be rich. What's wrong with wealth, with wealth according to pop culture? The answer, let's say Knives Out and The Menu and White Lotus, seems to be that wealth inevitably becomes a source of weakness, that it sinks people into a state of restless malaise while creating voids of insecurity and unfulfillable desire. In the last third of Triangle of Sadness, the previously invisible head of sanitation on the ship assumes this dictatorial position over her fellow castaways, and the suggested takeaway is that power itself inherently corrupts. All of those things may be true, but the conclusions feel obvious, too obvious probably. There is something a little different going on in Succession and Parasite, both of which have shown through detail and farce respectively, that wealth on that scale is, is objectionable because it specifically and necessarily depends on an exploitation of the poor. Succession features exclusively ultra, ultra rich people, but every time they interact with a working class or poor person, it has this clear ring of original sin. In the pilot, one of the family's failing sons casually and devastatingly promises a poor kid a million dollars if he can hit a home run. Later on, it surfaces that another one of the failing sons had paid a homeless man to get his initials tattooed on his forehead. Most consequentially, that failing son also watched a young cater waiter die in a river so that no one would ever have to know that he'd left his sister's wedding to go buy cocaine. In the case of Parasite, all the dramatic tension came from the literal proximity between the wealthy and the poor between the rich family and the poor family who infiltrates their house disguised as unrelated servants. And of course, in that movie, the protagonists were the poor family members themselves. I don't think it's coincidental that Succession and Parasite are the more successful as art, the least didactic, didactic and obvious, despite having a more explicitly structural framework of critique, suggesting that wealth doesn't sit apart from poverty, but that it depends on it. Both showed glimpses of the reality that contemporary society is so focused on encouraging and catering to affluence rather than, than alleviating poverty. That the greatest blind spot in narratives of success is that wealth is always accumulated, whether directly or indirectly, through exploitation. That my own comfortable life as an upper middle class person in Brooklyn is directly related to, even dependent on, the hardships of the people who pick and process the food I eat on a child and child care and school system that pays caregivers and teachers far less than what they're worth, on underpaid warehouse and delivery workers who make it possible for me to, when I feel a cold coming on, order my stupid little vitamins to arrive at my door overnight. And because there are so many people who are so much richer than me, these people who I see all the time in TV and in movies, these assholes with their chefs and their nannies and their housekeepers and their jets and their designer clothing, their homes on every continent and all this money they couldn't spend all of even if they tried. Because when I look at a screen, they could, I'm reminded only of people who have more money, of, more money than me, rarely of people who have less or much, 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 much less. The effect is that I could, if I wanted to, I can easily deny the reality of my own extreme comfort. I can think, if I want to, that we should eat the rich while neglecting to see that the systems that benefit the rich are also, of course, benefiting me. Another thought that I had, surely along with many other people, while watching White Lotus, these rich people are just really, really bad at having fun. Surely if I were on a luxury vacation in Hawaii or Sicily, I would be so chill and so grateful, just reading my little book, drinking my little wine, seeking out interesting historical sites, not eating at the goddamn hotel restaurant for three meals a day. <laughs> in fact, I have never personally had a bad time on vacation, so maybe, maybe all of this is as much of a character issue as a structural one, right? Maybe wealth can be tempered by awareness and gratitude. Maybe it's a matter of being the right kind of, of luxury vacationer. And then I realize I'm wandering down the same mental road that one percenters might be on watching White Lotus thinking, well, I, of course, am thankfully not like that. One step past that is an inversion, a feeling that wealth is undesir undesirable primarily from an emotional standpoint and not a structural one. This is the reaction that says, okay, wow, at least I'm not 
you know, Jennifer Coolidge on a yacht with a murderous cabal of gay fortune hunters. I'll just happily go back to my own regular life of sweating on the bus while things fall out of my grocery bag. Here again, I find myself thinking, thankfully, I'm not like that. Either of these feelings, which a person might acquire while viewing Eat the Rich Cinema, functions as a distortion of our viewing position. Either a sense that we're usefully close to or usefully distant from the situation, whichever happens to be more convenient, and either feeling can also serve kind of as an excuse for the situation at hand. If being rich makes people miserable, doesn't that misery function as a tax unto itself? And also, if we render wealth on that scale impossible, wouldn't we be curbing the reaches of our own fantasies and perhaps our eventual destinies if we somehow ascend to fantastic wealth through maybe some totally blameless means like writing a really successful movie about unhappy rich people? Maybe it's best that for now we just keep all this awful extravagance before us on screen, like a box of candy that we indulge in until halfway through we realize it's mildly poisonous. We get the satisfaction of having indulged in it, and then we get the sense of virtue that comes from being disgusted and turning away. But the, the unfortunate thing about thoughts or reactions in general is that they don't matter, <laughs> not the way that actions do. Capitalism is a machine for capturing dissent, and there are many forms of anti-capitalism that can exist, that can not just exist inside it, but feed it. Mark Fisher's famous concept of capitalist realism describes the widespread sense that capitalism is not just the only viable political and economic system, but that also that there are no real alternatives to it. In his book on the subject, he writes about another anti-capitalist movie, Pixar's WALL-E, in which a megacorporation called By and Large has destroyed the Earth, leaving giant baby-like humans to roam around their spaceships on motorized wheelchairs, watching screams and slurping junk out of cups. Kind of sounds good. Wally, Fisher writes, performs our anti-capitalism for us, allowing us to continue to consume with impunity. He notes that capitalist ideology never has to make a case for itself. It doesn't need propaganda, though we have plenty of it, obviously. Rather, capitalism just has to, he writes, conceal the fact that the operations of capital don't depend on any sort of subjectively assumed belief. We can feel cynical towards capitalism, we can reject it in name, we can critique it, we can question it, we can view every single one of our transactions within it ironically, but we're still acting within it. Fisher writes, so long as we believe in our hearts that capitalism is bad, we're free to continue to participate in capitalist exchange. Fisher calls upon Robert Fowler's concept of interpassivity to explain this paradigm one in which a work of art can perform a critique on behalf of its viewers. In his initial framing, Fowler writes about inner passivity as something like delegated enjoyment, like when you can't go out, for example, and you tell your friends to have a drink in your stead. He uses the example of Kafka, who at the end of his life was unable to drink beer because of tuberculosis, and he would go out in his little sanatorium village and invite someone to drink a beer in front of him. Fowler suggests that a conflict between a, a wish and a reality had resulted in a substitution. Kafka wants a beer, he can't drink a beer, so here's someone else to drink a beer in his place. A sitcom laugh track is another example. Fowler asks, does the use of canned laughter not suggest that there are viewers who are glad that they do not have to laugh themselves? But the question is why? Why would a viewer not want to laugh? Or let's take a sneaker, an object that Fowler suggests can perform some sort of gesture towards health and activity on behalf of the consumer, even when the consumer is not actually being healthy or active, something I would know nothing about. Why would we not want to be healthy and active on our own? With the sneaker here, a conduit might be serving as a substitution, I think. We think that some object, a sneaker, will allow us to achieve an objective, health, but the object instead substitutes for the objective while we're using it, allowing the objective to more swiftly disappear. This idea is obviously relevant, maybe, to eat the rich movies. They might substitute for the actual objective of eating the rich, allowing that objective to slide more conveniently out of sight. With the laugh track, it comes down to that conflict between wish and reality. We want to laugh, but the show is not funny enough to actually make us do it, so here's the laugh track to have fun in our stead. This too seems relevant. Maybe we'd like to, maybe we'd really like, we would like to capture excess individual wealth and put it to use improving collective well being in our degrading societies. But the people in charge of public policy are generally uninterested in doing so. And so instead, we just watch movies where giant mansions go up in metaphorical or literal flames. 
But Fowler suggests that in delegating our wish, we distance, we distance ourselves from it. And then we may come to require distance from it, that the delegated wish only remains pleasant as long as we can keep it at bay. So we can avoid carrying out our wish, and we cannot be, ab we cannot be blamed for avoiding it. After all, the wish began as something real. A person walks into a church to light a candle in prayer for another. That person then can walk out, delegating that prayer to the candle. A contemporary equivalent may be the Instagram story. We can focus for a minute or two, maybe 10, maybe 20, on highlighting some issue. And then we post it, delegating 24 hours of concentrated involvement to Instagram, where the story might substitute for our own sustained attention and work. Our desires have been become contained within symbolic representations of them. Do these representations preserve the desire? Do they give it a separate life? Do they perhaps make it last longer? Or do they dissipate the desire? Do they make that desire go away? Lauren Berlant defined cruel optimism as the relationship that develops between a person and the thing she desires, when that thing she desires serves as an obstacle to her own flourishing. The pursuit of unimpeachable wealth and stability or the American dream, is her primary example, that the unease that people feel while chasing this fantasy comes from the reality that the fantasy is out of reach. Or even if it, by some lottery ticket or another, it's not out of reach, the fantasy if lived out is fundamentally harmful. We could easily look at Eat the Rich Cinema in this way, as simply an exploration of cruel optimism in the lives of the characters on screen. But I've wondered if there's another version of cruel optimism that cruel optimism at work, a false one, in the ease with which Eat the Rich views are espoused or referenced or supported. After all, the people funding these movies and shows are rich. The people who are enriched by these movies and TV shows are rich. I'd guess that, just for one example, a significant amount of Succession's relatively small viewership was probably pretty rich too. In 1937, George Orwell argued that the standard leftist attitude was that class distinctions should be abolished. Very few leftists actually wanted to abolish them. He wrote, here you, come, here you come upon the important fact that every revolutionary opinion draws part of its strength from a secret conviction that nothing can be changed. The fact that has got to be faced is that to abolish class distinctions means abolishing a part of ourselves. It is easy for me to say that I want to get rid of class distinctions, but everything I think and do is a result of them. Zizek more recently proposed that people may invoke the need for revolutionary change as sort of a superstitious token against that change actually occurring. If we get rid of the ultra wealthy, what toxic fantasies will we live our own lives in dialogue with? Who will we point to whose carbon emissions are so much worse than ours? Who will be the people in comparison to whom we are always virtuous? What would be the subject of the next White Lotus or Knives Out? In other words, forget for a moment conceiving of a world without capitalism. I wonder if we've actually lost the imagination to conceive of a world without the ultra-rich, without the trickle-down fantasies that have allowed so many people to live out a version of this lifestyle at great cost to ourselves and others. The more or less average North American person frequently and ordinarily wants things that 100 years ago would have only been available to aristocracy. Maybe the near instant appearance of any food that a person is craving. Maybe the ability to travel across the globe. Maybe just disposable extravagance, decorations, commemorations for every season, purchased though it may be through Target or Amazon. If we strike down the lifestyles of billionaires, would we have to admit that something is wrong with the everyday rhythms and entitlements of middle class life too? I think the answer is yes, that all these complications are real and true, and also that the awareness, more or less ubiquitous in some circles, that we're all entangled in the immoral structures of capitalism, sometimes can obscure the actual scales at work here. I remind, my, I remind myself sometimes of a kind of Cohen, one of my co former coworkers used to tell me, that thinking can make you stupid. The fact that capitalism touches us all doesn't mean that from a standpoint of harm reduction, we shouldn't figure out how to economically kneecap the people who put as much carbon into the, year in one, carbon into the air in one year as entire nations have done in the last century. We would be so lucky to tax billionaires out of existence, to ever have the privilege of being the ones whose habits are slid directly onto the block to be chopped. Imagine the visions of peace and safety and abundance and social conflict and family drama and gossipy intrigue that would have to grow to supplant the old ones. Imagine how much art we could make about not just why we should eat the rich, but about actually doing it. Thank you. Um, 
I love that. And I want to know how it felt walking down the stairs as it <laughs> came out. Like, were you afraid you were going to fall? Were you I, just like, I'm in the moment. It feels good. Like, I am. Well, person. as we were discussing when we yeah. were checking the mics, I was like, one of the funniest things I could possibly do is just fall over the front and die. <laughs> um, I also had the thought, I was like, if I, was like, if I emerged totally naked, Mm. This would suddenly be like my worst nightmare. And then I was like, wait, Gia, actually like at any moment in your life if you were just naked, like that would actually be your worst nightmare in public. Like why are you only thinking of it now? But um, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> okay, okay, that's very good. Um, I was just going to say really quickly to you all, um, I've got about six different pages that I have to turn to, so you have to apologize. I have to apologize if I miss anything. But um, as a reminder, we'll be taking audience questions um, through Slido. So visit slido.com, which is S-L-I-D-O.com, um, and enter the code hashtag LindSlido, L-I-N-D-S-L-I-O. D-O, um, and input your questions. Uh, we'll be chatting for a little bit, so you can take your time thinking about what you want to ask. You know, you can drop comments like, I wish I could be on stage, um, which I do wish I could be on stage. Why didn't uh, you come out from the top? I did think you about that. You know, I did. There's so but many doors. Said, there was a carriage back there. I there sat was, in the carriage. I, I was through the chilling. curtains, like a little bit of a creep, like, you know, just <laughs> yeah. like peeking out on the side as you were talking. Yeah. Um, uh, but I was like, no, you know what? That would be maybe too. I feel nice. like if I did it, I would just make everything fall. Like you would just see me coming down and you just see the sort of stage crashing. And then the Lynn seminar would never, ever be held in a chance center because I somehow caused millions of dollars in damages. <laughs> Um, single-handedly. Um, you know the funniest thing would have been coming out through the top and then I just fall through the floor like in the prestige. <laughs> and then emerge from the bottom doorway yeah, that's yeah, right here. Yeah, yeah. No, that's 100 percent great. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to say thank you so much for that really, I think, like critical, incisive uh, talk. I have so many questions. Um, and I want to begin actually with um, one of the lines that you actually um, opened up with, which was or, sort of in the middle there, where you said, what is the nature of the recognition that viewers experience when they watch these things? Um, and as I was listening um, backstage on a chaise lounge, like reclining like a Victorian lady, um, <laughs> I was thinking to myself, you know, it feels like such a silly maybe question to ask about like, who was the audience for these kinds of shows, but I feel like it's such an important thing, the way you laid out for us a kind of history of the development of not just these kinds of like eat the rich shows, but also how media has shifted in some ways um, from a kind of romanticism of wealth to this kind of um, don't you feel so good and vindicated that you're not wealthy um, trajectory. And I, I, was, I, was, I was hearing you say that I was thinking about the kinds of audiences that are viewing and watching these shows. Um, and the ways that it, they're, they're being primed, perhaps, um, affectively or politically, um, to view wealth as something simply to be snide, like to think of as a snide kind of off comment or to feel vindicated they're not very wealthy and then not do anything on the other end, right? So kind of where you leave us, which is a kind of imaginary of what happens when we actually abolish wealth and the wealthy. Um, and so I'm thinking about the ways that we become primed to um, allow for exceptions in some ways um, in this envisioning of what the future can have. So the exception would be you see a kind of really wealthy person um, being a complete asshole, right, to folks who are working class, undocumented, et cetera. And with the screen be between you and them, you can sort of say, well, I will never do that. Um, but then you see politicians on stage like Trump, like Biden, of course, you know, like Hillary Clinton, who just tweeted, I don't know if y'all saw about let's, the whole let's Barbie about situation. Let's not talk well, about we it. won't talk about that so here. Shameful. Right? So we have these politicians who are very wealthy, who are very pedigreed, you know, who have been coming from these sort of long family genealogies of um, holding on to property, holding on to wealth, um, holding on to power. And we see them between, between us and them as a screen. Um, and in many ways, there's a kind of um, priming of our reaction to be like, well, that's just them. We'll have to accept, you know, the kind of least good situation in some ways. So I, I think about like the kind of viewers that watch, or at least the people that I think of who watch it, like these kinds of liberal oftentimes, middle class, upper middle class, people who can afford to get HBO, or as it, it's called here, Crave, um, oh, yeah. to watch it, right? Like to watch a session, you know, <laughs> yeah. to watch the Triangle of Sadness. So I just wanted to hear you talk a little bit more about audiences mm -hmm. and how certain kinds of audiences are being primed almost by viewing these shows to react to the political realities of the world differently almost, right? Well, the um, thing that I think yeah. about most when, the, when I think about audience for these shows mm -hmm. and when I think about the extremity of income inequality is that the the scale on the upper end is mm -hmm. so distorting to perceptions of mm -hmm. what wealth is and what our own p position is. Mm -hmm. Like I think um, 
Like, I think that's, that really is one of my personal biggest beefs with the perpetual presence of people with private jets on TV is that it allows people in the sort of resource, resource hoarding top 10%, mm -hmm. you know, top 20% in which I find my, in which, in which I inhabit to believe, like to, to say with a straight face, we're not rich. It's why like you have people in New York mm -hmm. who make 250K a year being like, I'm not rich, I'm middle class. And, and they can genuinely believe that, but there's so many people taking mm -hmm. hel like helicopters to the Hamptons mm -hmm. all the time. And so like, I think one of the functions that these shows have with their audience is they can, mm -hmm. they just very swiftly convince meaningfully rich people, global one percenters, mm -hmm. if not national one percenters that we, that they are not, you know, that the problem is not them, when yeah. in fact, as we know, the problem is almost always, always us, no matter where we, you know. And, and I think also even, you know, I remember, let's take Bernie, for example. Remember when people were coming after him yeah. for having a, like a lake house, mm -hmm. you know, and, and for like having a net worth that was over a million dollars. And I was mm -hmm. like, okay, I think a man in his 70s should be able to have a lake house and have accumulated enough money to retire on, you know? Yeah. Like, I think, I think that um, the, the fear, you know, there, there's some implicit fear that's like, like the, there are so many... There are so many scales of comfort mm. that I think are mm. not just mm. allowed but welcomed in my dream world of yeah. socialist evening, you know? Like yeah. it's that, um, you know, I think, I think that the, the, yeah, the main thing I think about is how, is just how distorting it is to, mm -hmm. to look at this extremely, extremely small group of the ultra wealthy yeah. all the time on TV. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I feel like it, it really ties into like, uh, we were talking about this earlier in the seminar, like the kinds of delusions that people um, imagine for themselves and the world around them, the realities that they craft in some ways, um, which is just kind of really wild. Like I can't even fathom in some ways what it is to be that wealthy. And yet there is always, as you say, a kind of vision of I can be more wealthy and right. also at least I'm not that wealthy. Yeah. Like, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not one of the bad ones. Yeah, so, but do I'm I want to go to that hotel? Exactly. I'm one of Sicily? the good like, wealthy I, people. I desperately exactly. want to go to that exactly. hotel. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, to be honest though, I, I kind of want to like, peek in, you know, like a little bit yeah. of a voyeur, you know, like it feels a little bit um, like a bad object that feels really good to love or titillate in, you know, you're like you're peeking into how terrible they are. Um, and as you're saying, it makes you feel so good to not be there, you know. Um, but I was thinking also about this kind of obsession that we have, I think, contemporaneously with bad objects, like how much we love to hate. Um, I'm a hater myself. Um, I love <laughs> drinking haterades so very much. But I love this idea of like watching things to hate. And I'm thinking also about like how hatred in some ways as a kind of political affect or as a kind of um, emotional experience that we have, um, not just because we're experiencing, I think, quite a lot of tumultuous things happening right now in the world, right? Um, but how hate becomes a kind of... Um, space maybe for either, on the one hand, this kind of vitriolic right-wing um, hatred that we see every day, right? Um, we see the kinds of support that Trump gets, for example, or we see the kinds of um, reality that's represented in fiction, such as with succession, et cetera. Um, but also, um, maybe, maybe hate is maybe the wrong terminology, but the kind of um, righteous rage that emerges actually from sort of v seeing these visions of terribleness in the world. And I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit more about how you're, you've grappled with mm -hmm. or, or how you're thinking about grappling with, like these kinds of emotions that, that emerge that feel maybe uh, really terrible to feel, but are actually maybe necessary to propel action, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than just simply sitting, yeah. Well, your button, I mean, we, were, we yeah. were talking in the parking lot. I was, I was saying, like someone asked me recently if I thought hatred could have some sort of creative function in art. And I was like, that's an interesting question. I think anger absolutely does, rage mm -hmm. absolutely does. But hatred is, you know, it's like, to me, I think of, you know, it's not an emotion that I countenance or often mm -hmm. feel, except I have been feeling it lately about a lot so of celebrities much. that will not open their mouths about Gaza. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I was thinking, but, but in terms of the way that hatred intersects with the eat the rich situation, yeah. It's, it's interesting to me, like, so much open political hatred is directed yeah. towards people's identities, right? Mm -hmm. And this is, but, but somehow this feels taboo when uttered towards mm -hmm. the rich, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. that, and, and the funny thing about that is that rich is not an identity, right? Like, yeah. class, is not a, class is not an identity that is fixed. Class is the most important identity that is entirely not fixed, that's entirely fungible, that can change radically within a person's lifetime. Mm -hmm. And I think we should, we, 
we think of rich as an identity that is as fixed as one's ethnic heritage or the place you were born, you know, or your gender identity or sexuality. It's mm -hmm. not that those things are fixed, but you know what I mean? Something that is essential when, when being a billionaire, like I, th there's some people, I think there's a sense that some people when, when they, when we, one says that billionaires shouldn't exist, they think you mean murder them. <laughs> and oh, it's like, well, <laughs> right, right. They think, they think you mean the guillotine, which, you know, we can discuss, but we can discuss that, we can discuss I mean, that about, yeah, th there's certain, but, but no, it means, it means, it doesn't mean what hatred of specific identity groups mm -hmm. means. It means a positive desire for a certain kind of tax policy. And yet it's, you know, criticizing the rich is often interpreted as almost a taboo kind of yeah. hatred when in fact it's like, this is, the, this is the one specific kind of identity that, that we, we can, should all come together for. Yeah, right? that we yeah. can remove from people, mm -hmm. that we should treat, treat class and wealth as, as so much more fungible and yeah. flexible than it is. But of course, the fact that we don't reflects the reality that often it's not, but mm -hmm. it could be, right? Mm -hmm. um, we, could, we could get rid of the, class, you know, the way we understand class by changing it. By, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I personally, hatred doesn't come, it hasn't it come easily coming. to mm -hmm. me until the last few months. Yeah, often. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel like, I, I totally agree with you there. Like, I feel like, there are certain moments in, in time where you really just feel um, very acutely and very keenly how much there are people who have power in this world, who structure how we not just see the world, but also are able to live it. And you know, that's turned up for me for George Floyd protests, Eric Garner protests back in 2014. Um, it shows up again around October 7th and what's happening with Gaza and Palestine. It's just, you see repeatedly how the world is being structured so that how the wealthy continue to retain their wealth, continue to retain their property, continue to dispossess people of their like, lives in so many ways. Right. Um, and it's a difficult space to sit in, right? And then well, and watch shows like, what, like that. What is yeah. wealth for? What is power exactly. for? If not to throw it at this wall of, you know, of hideous genocide. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't understand yeah. what it's for. And, and it's like, I understand, you know, I mean, like Hollywood, we were talking about celebrities specifically. Yeah. And it's like, sure, I mean, there is obviously so much horrific repression going mm -hmm. on. And, you know, if Susan Sarandon can get fired by your agent, mm -hmm. anyone else can. But it's like, if you're not going to get fired for your agent for this, what the fuck are you doing? You know? <laughs> like, yeah. 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 And we were also, this is a little context, we were talking about our favorite and most disliked American celebrities on the way over here. I actually wanted to the Canadian ones. Oh, me? Oh, Canadian. <laughs> you see, okay, so I'm relatively new to Canada, so I don't, yeah, the yeah, only yeah. one I know is like Justin Bieber. Yeah. The Weeknd. <laughs> Drake, um, <laughs> but I've been told I can't hate on Drake because he represents Toronto, apparently. I don't know if anyone's here from Toronto, but you can confirm nor deny whether that's true. I've also been told that um, Justin Bieber isn't Canadian anymore. He's actually American, I've been mm. told. Like, they, like there's, there was a trade that was done uh -huh, where like, uh -huh. they like, gave Justin Bieber to the Americans and then Americans got Shania Twain or yeah, something. Yeah, like, yeah. switched over <laughs> Shania Twain to Cana Canada. It was like a whole thing. Broke it was a whole a thing. treaty. Yeah. yeah, there was a little, a little treaty. It's actually written now. You can find it uh, somewhere in, in time. <laughs> Um, and so we were thinking about like how like celebrities are also part of this kind of uber wealthy um, picture in so many ways, right? Uh, where we see like the Taylor Swift with her uh, film and the Beyonce with her film, well, et cetera. Yeah. Interestingly, I mean, I, I'm sorry, I feel like no, I just no. cut you off your question, no, no, but no, no, I no. think about this. Um, I it's it's interesting the way that celebrity Hollywood celebrity functions in mm -hmm. terms of I think wealthy self perception because actors, musicians visual artists are a rare example, I think, a relatively rare example where extreme wealth can be acquired. You know, it's obviously not exclusively mm -hmm. through talent, but it is kind of through this almost like just accident of sometimes of just profound ability, mm -hmm. profound, obvious ability. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's why rich people love to hang around. So that's one of the reasons really, really yeah. rich people love to hang around celebrities so much mm -hmm. because it, it casts that glow of sort of, um, you know, pure deservingness of, mm -hmm. of just like the, the radiation of the thing that creates the privilege rather mm -hmm. than all of the material, you know, industrial otherwise structures that feed most, the, you know, the vast majority of other wealth on earth. Yeah. But, but, yeah. but because celebrity wealth is by far the most visible, mm -hmm. I think it often mm -hmm. renders wealth itself something that is, seemed as like self-achieved, right? Yes. Yeah, um, rather yeah. than, yeah, built on yeah, enormous no, structures. I mean, I think you're 100% right there because I've been thinking about that, like, who we see on TV is, of course, a portrayal, right? But then when we think about our real lives, like who we think of as the kind as of rich big, people, it's like just celebrities. Like, I don't know. It's, it's, <laughs> like, most of them are celebrities. Yeah. <laughs> they've got, you've got Jeffrey Bezos, 
um, or as I call him, the Amazon Trust Fund, right? We've got um, maybe Tesla dude. Um, and yeah, then you've got billionaires and celebrities, yeah. and then you've got a bunch of celebrities, right? And I've been wondering about that kind of dynamic, where you know, as we're sort of seeing the portrayals on a kind of like White Lotus, et cetera, like these families who have wealth, right? And the wealth is maybe not as flaunted or as recognizable, I think, to the general public in some ways. Like I'm thinking also of like, you know, rush season in Texas, for example, where there are all of these like really, really wealthy um, students who are rushing for different like sororities, et cetera. And the ways that wealth is displayed are ways that seem almost alien because the way we're, it's represented on TV is totally different. We're imagining, you know, it's going to be the suits, it's going to be the blinged out cars, the limos in New York, but actually a lot of this wealth is kind of like this kind of subtle old wealth in some ways. So I wanted to know if you had a kind of thoughts on that kind of, um, I don't know, longer histories of how, especially I think in the American context, wealth is built on this kind of indigenous dispossession and kind of long histories of enslavement and the families that carry them are oftentimes so unknown that we don't even know who to eat in some ways. Like, we, we don't know. <laughs> like, we know some of the big ones, but we don't even know who to eat. Oh, the really, eat. really big ones. The I really, have no, really big ones. We have, we have no, no idea. idea, right? Yeah. There's a kind of, um, I'm, the, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about... There's 30 shell corporations deep into, exactly like, the, it. Yeah, know, the, I was the, wondering the, if you could talk a little bit about how, like, this becomes a shell game almost, right? Like, you keep pulling the doll, you know, the Russian doll or the Mastryoshka doll, um, and it just keeps getting another piece of the puzzle. Like, how do we begin, or how do you imagine we might begin to even unpack some of the ways that capital has dispersed itself so vastly that we can't even find who it is to think about eating? <laughs> right. Um, well, I think, um, yeah, I, I often find myself thinking, you know, like this, as I was saying at the seminar, yeah. like this has been a like, hideously crushing week for journalism. Um, you know, after many, just it feels like a cycle, like so many people laid off for no reason, well, just because venture capitalists wanted to like cut the fat for just this much more profit mm -hmm, this next mm -hmm. year. And, you know, it's, it's really, really hideous. And I think often about, like, you know, the, the, the talks, this incredible show on HBO, this, like, living lobotomy, The Gilded Age. I don't know if anyone watched it. It was just so beautiful. Mm -hmm. I watched all of both seasons, couldn't tell you a single person's name, just like... But it was so great. I loved it. Mm -hmm. But it was like, you know, it made me... Like, I was like, if, why can't... Uh, like... Why can't more of these rich people just fund publications? Like, well, like, where, what, where, where for the Gilded Age era arts patronage? You know, like, if if anything, right? Like, why, um, like, where wealth was so ostentatiously visible that it had to be publicly channeled into things like museums and giant marble libraries yeah. and like, or even let's go back, let's mm -hmm. talk Medici's into just like mm -hmm. patronizing, art, like literally patronizing artists. Like, um, and, and now, you know, there, it does feel like one of the things that's colluding in the, mm -hmm. in the blurring of scale and the confusion of like what is actually, you know, the New York Times has a calculator that's like, are you rich? And it's mm -hmm. like, oh, whoa, whoa, your... whoa. I got to fill that out right now. Y'all <laughs> go ahead. Y'all go ahead. Y'all have a like, conversation. And it like, you know, it, it asks you your income and then mm -hmm. it asks you to put your zip code in and then it asks you what percentile you would need to be in to consider yourself rich, right? And then it tells you whether or not you make it. And I think when these things come out, there's always a lot of mismatch. There's always mm -hmm. like not a lot of people depending on their location, people in like coastal American cities mm -hmm. never think they're rich even when they're top 5% or whatever of income. Yeah. And, and I think, yeah, I mean, aesthetically, yeah. like, Beautiful. <laughs> why don't we have more of this? Like, it, instead, it's just, you know, I, I really blame the, sil mm -hmm. the Silicon Valley, you know, like a slacker boy dropout class that has turned mm -hmm. the billionaire look into just like shitty hoodie, like oh any, any one of the rest of us slobs, mm -hmm. you know? Um, like, there is, there is this, with, in, like, I don't think it's an accident that this whole like quiet luxury stealth mm -hmm. wealth, logo less baseball cap, mm -hmm. minimalist leather bag, like classy neutrals, like that being the true sign of, you know, I'm wearing a $19,000 cashmere sweater that is unmarked and is just gray, you know, like yeah. I, I find that like quite pernicious. Mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. it's like, I want, like, if anything, give me the peacocking, give yeah. me the arts patronage, mm -hmm. like, give me, give me all that old fashioned shit mm -hmm. instead of whatever it is we have now where like, you know, I think, I think also, you know, I have, I have a friend that's extremely, extremely wealthy. And I mm -hmm. think that he thinks that he's about like three times as rich as, you know, the people he knows when the reality is, you know, it's, mm -hmm. 
many, 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 many times more than that. But I think because the aesthetic difference in one's life is maybe yeah. like, it's maybe just three times as fancy. Yeah. Th then you think that that's, you know, th there's this equivalent of thinking that that's what's going on. There are all sorts of like aesthetic distortions going mm -hmm. on. Yeah. I really hear, I want to go, I'm going to totally go and enter some of my colleagues' uh, salaries because you can find your salaries, your UBC salaries <laughs> online. For anyone who doesn't know, you should go and look and see how much our public uh, figures are making here at UBC. <laughs> um, I'm going to actually turn this over to some of the audience questions. So I hope you've had a little bit of time to think of them um, before I start moving it on. And we've got a good number of them. Can um, I tell you a story that's totally unrelated? Please tell me, please tell me. Please so tell one me time I was thing. doing one of these Q&As, I was yes. moderating it, and I was, um, I was really nervous because I was, it was with Zadie Smith, and I was like, ah! you know, and then, um, and you know, we were taking Q and A's, and I was yeah. reading them, and one of the Q and A's was, like, they were all for Zadie, or smart questions, whatever, yeah. and then it was like, hey, Gia, <gasps> in college, you dated this <gasps> really lame guy named Josh. Why did you date him for as long as you did? I would have, <laughs> no. And I was just like on stage, like, and I couldn't see anyone's faces, and I was just like, who is it? <laughs> I would have, is that you, Josh? Immediately, no. I would have immediately gotten up, walked off stage, and not said anything to Zadie, I was like. I was like, like I was really, anyway. So I hope oh you get gosh. a really personal question. Well, in I'm about to, I'm sure. Off, yeah. I hope someone in there in the audience who knows me can send me a personal question and I'll let you all know what that question is. Um, okay, so let's get it started. So we have um, a question from Jason over here um, who says, can you speak to the complicity of liberal academia, which Ooh. has become increasingly technocratic oh and beholden God. to wealthy elites in upholding capitalist re realism? Oh my um, God. I think, uh, <laughs> I mean, all of, probably most of y'all here in the room are better placed than me to speak on this, but of course, I mean, I got a free college education because mm -hmm. of a donor, right? Like, I, I got, I was on a, like, private foundation scholarship to the University of Virginia. Mm -hmm. My entire education, I've been on scholarship at fancy places. Mm -hmm. I, like, I have rich people, have, rich people's donations have paid for, like, literally my personal entire academic life. And, you know, my, my MFA program, it was this incredible program where I had learned to really, like, it was where I learned to cook in the kitchen, so to speak, in regarding to writing, regards to writing. And it was because a billionaire named Sam Zell, like, just gave a giant grant, you know. And, and you know, th this is just, you know, our complicity at an individual yeah. level. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's like, what am I going to do? Not take three years to write whatever I want at age 21? I'm, like, of course I'm taking that, you know. But... It's, I think I have nothing more, I have nothing more like cogent to say than it's just so clear mm -hmm. that it is like, you know, it's a, the wor the deeper we get in, the more absolutely inextricable it becomes. Yes. There's no, yeah. like even at a public education level, you know, my, like I'm just starting to see educational systems through the lens of like my three-year-old that just entered blessedly public school in Brooklyn because we have public 3K mm -hmm. and you know, the school is quite under-resourced that mm -hmm. she's in. And it's like, yeah, if a rich person wanted to donate a bunch of shit to the school, I'd love it, you know? And, and I see how quickly this thing starts and how quickly it would take hold and why you get Google Chromebooks being the main infrastructure of mm -hmm. entire public school systems, mm -hmm. you know, in the city gathering all their surveillance data, you know, on these five-year-olds or whatever. Yep. And, and it starts there. It starts with the starving of education mm -hmm. as like a federally funded value. Mm -hmm. And it starts really at childcare, I mm -hmm. think. And then it just gets all the way, you know, and, and then it's, mm -hmm. and then it's at, at, at its own level of the university, which is trying to both like take in as much capital as possible and act as sort of a protective bubble against it at the same time. And it kind of feels like at best, the values of academia provide a kind of like surfactant bubble, mm. but it's just that. It's just a surfactant bubble that is not really separating anything from anything. Yeah, very much so. And I think this is one of the things that a lot of students and faculty and staff who are part of academia are always grappling with, or not, all, not many, some of us. <laughs> uh, some of us are grappling with in some ways, right? Like, especially as UBC is a public institution, many of us being educated at private institutions as you know, being funded by private donors, et cetera, how do you both refuse those kinds of realities and also be the refusal within the spaces that you're in, even if you're in complicit spaces in so many ways. Yeah, that's great. We've got another question here, uh, which 
takes us back to the question of TV shows mm -hmm. um, and brings in one of my favorite shows from when I was young, which is Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, so Anonymous says, pop culture used to depict ultra wealth as fun. So Clueless, uh, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Um, what and when do you think precipitated our shift to cynicism of extreme wealth? I really think you can track these things along. I mean, I bet, you know, it's, it's sort of like when you look at Google Trends and you map two things together. If there was a way to do this with, it, with what happened to income inequality, mm. you know, let's say like two post-2008, no chance we're getting shit as fun as Clueless, you yeah. know? Like, we're not getting that fun little closet, you know? We and got a me Mean Girls remake, which was not great, but we got a Mean Girls yeah. remake, which I think that, that's... We'll go back. We'll, well, we'll talk about it later. Let's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Take, like, <laughs> let, let's take the remake of the original Gossip Girl. Like, yeah. like the, here's my, you know, purely spontaneous, probably bad theory. It, you know, post 2008, that's the that's the final. Like, I bet you can track really the the rise of the rise of income inequality in the last three decades, like, and and the decline of um, wealth being presented as. I think the amazing time it often is, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like 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 not showing the um, the fact that yeah, uh, and yeah. but let's take the Gossip Girl remake. Mm -hmm. Like Gossip Girl first started airing when I was in college pre-recession, and I guess it continued post-recession, but it was this like frothy celebration mm -hmm. of like we're rich bitches, we have an amazing life, mm -hmm. and the remake, which I guess came out. I don't know, 2021 or something. It was it was all tangled up in itself because all the characters were teenagers in 2020, and they knew that there was something wrong with being that privileged. Mm -hmm. Not with them, but there was something ultimately morally wrong with the world that allowed that to coexist mm -hmm. along so much suffering. Mm -hmm. And this was and and I think that that there is just this larger consciousness consciousness of that post occupy whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's post occupy. That's the mark. Yeah. And um, and I think that, but, but we still want to see rich people, right? We still want to see those giant closets. We just don't want to see, we can't countenance, or, this, or the guilty liberal screenwriters can't stand to write people being purely happy in them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I feel like that's really actually really great with another question we have about the American dream and the kinds of promises that wealth or financial security, we'll just call it that, to use a euphemism. Financial security. Um, comfort. I'm comfortable. Comfort. Yeah, I'm comfortable. comfortable. I'm comfortable. You know, I'm not rich, but I'm comfortable. Um, and thinking about, I think, the sort of longer, like the sort of rise, I think, in, in the sort of maybe 2000s onward of a kind of romantic anti-capitalism in some ways, which mm. um, has defined in so many ways the kinds of um, oftentimes right-wing um, are very poor uh, folks who are or communities in the United States, for, in some, for, instance, for instance, right? So um, this idea that how you work with your hands, you are um, a minor, you are defined by the kinds of like, physical labor that you do. Um, and that kind of romantic anti-capitalism is a defining feature oftentimes of uh, the rural South in some ways or of the rural Midwest um, in the US. But how does that, and how that pairs with actually folks who are uh, very low income, who are really, um, disenfranchised by systems voting, quote unquote, against their interests. And this is a question, essentially, which is the, the American dream seems to promise a kind of wealth and financial security, but what do you think of folks who are in these kinds of uh, fantasies, almost, of being both against the kind of capitalism but still voting for someone like Trump? Um, what do you think causes them to vote against their own interests? Do you think it's their hopes of becoming rich? Is there something else that's part of that? Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, obviously there are political scientists that have real answers for this, but mm -hmm. I, which of, of which I'm certainly not one. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's this thing that, like, people, there's that saying that in America everyone's always, like, everyone, you're a temporarily embarrassed millionaire. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's a way in which people, um, and this is, again, this is part of the distortion that goes on by, by, the sort of cathexis that you feel mm -hmm. that one feels towards wealth on TV. You feel, I feel that I feel that I'm closer, I'm mm -hmm. somehow closer to that yeah. than I am to, you know, bankruptcy and impoverishment. Mm -hmm. And like, and I'm not denying, like I, I live, like my, my parents, the class mobility, their immigrant class mobility that they wanted to appear uh, in Canada and the United States mm -hmm. by getting me to all these schools on scholarship, like it worked. I'm upper middle class now, I'm not like saying I'm not. But it's like, I'm much closer to bankruptcy <laughs> than I am yeah. to generational wealth, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think that 
And, and, and that exists along with like, the fact that I'm upper middle mm -hmm. class. And I think that in America, there's especially, there's this deception about that, that you think you're closer mm -hmm. to being the person that might have stuff be taken away mm -hmm, mm -hmm. by those taxes, by those tax brackets, than you yeah. are to be the person that needs help. Mm -hmm. And we're all the person that needs help at some point in our life mm -hmm. or other. Yeah. And it's, it's like disability or it's something like that. It's like we are born into it and we, and we leave this earth with it. It's like we're the, the reality of dependence and, and interdependence and mm -hmm. financial need is so counter to, mm -hmm. to the American ideal of sort of like frontier individualism. And like, if I make it, I'm going to make it on my own. And none of you motherfuckers are going to take any of this away from me. Mm -hmm. That is the essential narrative of the entire country you know, the reason why mm. this election is going to be what it is, messy. you know? Yeah. Um, and there's like, the, the, I can think of no more narrative that is more, the, I can think of no narrative that is more fundamental to American identity. I mean, and I know from the South, I'm from Texas, like it's, um, there's a way that that fits, there's a way that that mentality, you know, like I, um, like even, like I have plenty of, like extended family, not my own family, because they can't vote because they're Canadian. Um, like who are, you know, like immigrant Trump voters who, mm -hmm. who think like mm -hmm. we made it the right way. So we went yeah. and I'm like, did you make it? You know, like, yeah. did, like I don't know, but there, but there's so, there's something so powerful about that idea that when I do, I'm keeping all of it. You yeah, know? yeah. That's also a Drake lyric, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> uh, 100%. I don't listen to much Drake, but I'm pretty sure that's a Drake lyric. Um, but I think you're right, this kind of thing where the American dream becomes a kind of the sweetest poison you can drink, um, killing you on the inside, and yet it tastes so good to hold on to that kind of fantasy in so yeah. many ways. Um, we've got a, another question related to that, but this is more about how media is um, thinking about it. So mm. the question is, what do you think of how TikTok... Huh. Uh -huh, we knew we were going to come to TikTok at some point. TikTok is normalizing these kinds of ultra-wealthy lifestyles um, and hyper-consumption. So my point earlier about um, rush season that's happening, you know, um, part of that is like TikTok has become the site for folks who are rushing to show off what yeah, they're wearing. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is my $16,000 ring. This is my Hermes bag. This is my, you know, kind of thing. Um, so what do you think of how TikTok is normalizing ultra-wealthy ultra lifestyles? Um, and do you see that there is a bar being um, shift that's shifting from what's perceived as normal um, as a result of that? Well, I think there's a way in which the, the trappings of wealth are, have become available to like feign mm. or borrow or cheat your way into a visual display on TikTok. Like, like I think the, the, the increasing mediation of life mm. through surveillance technology allows for many more opportunities for like an aesthetic or an illusion of extreme mm -hmm. wealth to mm -hmm. be perpetuated even by people mm -hmm. that don't necessarily have it. Like it can make it feel as with these TV shows, yeah. far more ubiquitous than it does. And of course there's the whole like focalizing algorithm, you know, yeah. effect where you look at, you know, A, I'm not on TikTok, but it's, if you look at one sort of like, you know, plane check and it's someone walking mm -hmm. up a private plane that they could literally have just rented mm -hmm. for $500 for the hour for a photo mm -hmm. op, like, then you'll just see more and more and more of that forever. And like, that, that's its own sort of algorithm problem. But I think, um, I think that, yeah, I think that TikTok, <laughs> I, I, well, I'm, I'm specifically thinking of like Sophia Coppola's daughter, yeah. you know, yeah. going viral. She's yeah. like, I chartered a helicopter to go see my camp friend, which mm -hmm. I, I loved, frankly. Um, I was like, that's the kind of fun shit you should be doing if you're rich. <laughs> like, just using your parents' credit card to charter a helicopter. Mm -hmm. I, um, yeah, I think there it's like, the problem is how, like, fundamentally untrustworthy anything you see on it is. And also... Mm -hmm. Like once you start looking, you'll only see that. Yeah. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's the algorithm doing doing on its own. Mm -hmm. um, what what this whole thing I was talking about is yeah. doing. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. It's like we start thinking algorithmically. Also, like I I think about the compulsion that we feel almost to swipe constantly, and you still see more and more images of the kind of wealth um, that's on TikTok or even YouTube Shorts, which is a new thing, or Instagram, even watching people's reels. Um, and I'm wondering too, um, this is my own side question, about this like 
maybe move against compulsion to kind of consume almost uh, the wealthy without actually eating or breaking well, down. Yeah, yeah it's wealth. like I, I think so much about. It. I think like one of the greatest and most you know like baldly obvious mm -hmm. issues with the internet is that it's everything on it is exclusively a representation. It's never yeah. the thing itself. Yeah. And so rarely is what we're looking for the representation of the thing. Mm -hmm. The thing we always, I think, fundamentally want is the thing itself. We don't want the representation mm -hmm. of happiness. We want happiness. We don't want the representation of being valued. We want to feel valued in the physical rooms mm -hmm. that we're in, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that, that, that kind of feeling of whatever it is, like, antipathy or attraction mm. or whatever it is that you might be feeling while scrolling past mm. someone that's on a boat in the, you know, the armpit of February when you're shivering in the cold and like just want to feel a sunbeam on your face. Mm. Not that I'm speaking from, you know, <laughs> experience, <d> direct recent <laughs> experience. Um, like it, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling all of that at, it's, it's all at just, the representation of reality when mm -hmm. the thing that I'm, the thing that, the thing that I'm actually upset about is the fact that, you know, is, is the material fact mm -hmm. that some people can go on vacation three weekends out of every month and some people will never get a vacation in their life, basically, you know? And yeah. it's like, that's the thing I'm angry about. I'm also angry because I haven't seen the sun in enough time, but I, but, but really it's like what, the, the compulsion to sort of like mediate our political reactions mm -hmm. through just the representations of them on social mm -hmm. media, it feels, yeah, it feels like the same as, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's so, what you're seeing, I feel that so deeply because I think also about the kinds of like, and I, I wanna hear like what you're thinking also, like where we go from just viewing these things or, or wanting the kinds of things that it might give us or the object might represent for us, right? Like wanting happiness, but instead you go and watch a video of someone laughing and smiling and performing happiness and you feel kind of empty inside, but some lizard part of your brain, that little small pleasure center was hit, so you hit it again, you hit it again with the hopes that you somehow eventually will come across another video that makes you feel a little bit happy and I'm wondering, uh, what your thoughts are about how to turn that kind of slamming of the button in some ways or the pursuit of representation towards actual action. Like, do you have, now this is one of the questions that we have, like, yeah. um, do you, like, what do you see as kinds of ways to push us towards this kind of movement rather yeah. than simply stasis in watching and viewing and consuming? I think about this when we were talking in the seminar. I was yeah. like, it, it, I, be, I felt in 2020 it became extremely clear for me mm -hmm. that that when I looked at when I, like any mediated or surveilled experience made me feel, made me feel less human mm -hmm. and any unsurveilled, unmediated experience where I was directly in the physical presence of another human mm -hmm. made me feel more human, mm -hmm. right? And I think like for better and worse, I'm driven by like simple desire and yeah. pleasure seeking instincts. And the thing that has helped me in this quest is just like, I have realized that I'm not laughing when I look at the internet anymore. And yeah. I, I used to find the internet really funny and I, I don't really. Mm -hmm. And that makes me really extraordinarily sad. Yeah. And even like my pandemic era substitute where I would just text my group text for four hours a day, mm -hmm. I'm not laughing as much as I am mm -hmm. on my group text. And I'm mm -hmm. like, I don't know what to do. I don't know if this thing mm -hmm. isn't making me laugh, like what, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and, and I think the only way to extricate yourself from the, like I just physically have to block things. Like I, yeah. Yeah. I have a program on my computer called self-control and I have a program on my phone called freedom and I use them both <laughs> and mm -hmm. that's it. They just lock me out of my shit mm -hmm. after like X amount, you know, 45 mm -hmm. minutes a day on my, on my desktop, you know, and whatever. Um, but, but I think, you know, I often think about like, you, you, I'm on the bus all the time on Brooklyn again, like sweating in my winter coat and, um, and everyone on the bus around you is just, you're, everyone's fucking exhausted. You're picking yeah. up your kid, yeah. you've got your groceries, you know, you're traipsing, you know, it's a 45 minute journey back home. Mm -hmm. And this, it's like the labor marketplace and the housing market and just everything about, Life is grinding, you know, this artificial scarcity is grinding our asses down so that it's better to kind of push reality out of our eyes for a second mm -hmm. and just mm, 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 
over and over. And yeah. that's something that I do all the time when I'm just like, and you know, I mean, and that's just part of that. Maybe it's just a condition of being human as much as like whatever mm -hmm. material structures, right? Like, like I do that when my baby hasn't been sleeping and I'm just like, oh, I can't think about my life. I'm just going to look at some shit, you know? <laughs> and, and, you know, so like to some extent that's inextricable, but I do think like it does, it does feel that these kind of like always on sources of extremely thin pleasure mm -hmm, are completely mm -hmm. related to mm -hmm. door dashing as a second job or, you know, whatever, yes. all of these things that have become equally ubiquitous where it's yeah. like your day is going to suck. So mm -hmm. you better have, and you don't have space to do anything else. You yeah. better just have this little machine mm -hmm. that can show you little videos of things that you like love or hate or make you mm -hmm. angry. Yeah. I hear what you're saying about the videos not really bringing joy the minute cat videos stopped making me like thrill and uh, that's when I knew it was over. Yeah, um, I was the, like, the memes, the memes cat? are bad for me. I was like, also I'm old, like I don't know what it is, like whichever thing it is, but they've got to bring the memes are not time. hitting for me They're anymore. not hitting, yeah, 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 they're not. I, <laughs> so many references, there's way over the head in so yeah. many ways. What you're saying is like so, it feels so real, like the moment of um, the threshold for what it is to even imagine a life that is not embedded in these systems. Um, it's so low that how you're not even looking sometimes for joy, you're just looking for to bring yourself up to boredom well, even, and, right? And also, like, like someone, yeah. someone asked me recently, like to, they were like, okay, which do you think is better, the smartphone or cigarettes? And I was oh. like, like, I'm sorry, like, <laughs> no, no, I, I truly mean no offense to like anyone mm -hmm. who has been personally harmed by lung cancer, but I was like, cigarettes are so much better, sorry. <laughs> like, it's like, I, I was like, cigarettes, they're murderous, they're awful, yeah. but they're also amazing and they make yeah. people feel really good and I yes. love them and I, I yeah. miss them and you know. They're social too. You always go and you get a cigarette yeah, with like, a friend, like, like unfortunately, you're bumbling off of someone. Yeah. yeah, like unfortunately like New Year's Eve I had my first cigarette in 18 months. I've been pregnant so much and I was just like nothing has ever felt better than this oh, in yeah. my life, you know? <laughs> but then I was like, smartphones, okay, what are they doing wrong? Mm -hmm. They are like, they are corroding our souls. They are yep. putting us under a constant state of surveillance. They are scraping every single action, question, word we have into just this like massive cloud of data that is being monetized beyond our control. Like they're, you know, they, they are, they are ruining our concentration. They are ruining our ability to sit in a room with each other without like twitching. You know, and you know, like they, they are just, they're so little, like it, it, they're, they're so profoundly, profoundly bad. And yet, yeah. they, the smartphone, my smartphone is entwined with every single person that I love and want to talk to, mm -hmm. every mm -hmm. single thing that I've mm -hmm. ever cared about, every piece of organizing, every piece of work, mm -hmm. you know, everything that I love and hold, hold dear in my life is also wrapped up with this machine. Mm -hmm. And and I don't know how to make sense of, you know, there's just kind of no, no way to square that. There's no yeah. good way to fall on how do you deal with this, yeah. I, you know? Yeah, it's so true. Like, you just, it becomes the mode of socialization even as it becomes a kind of anti-relational, um, yeah. like, technology. Like, you can't actually do the thing that you want, but you also need this to do all the things you want and right. be with the people that you want. Um, especially in COVID times, like, as we're thinking about how folks have been able to either relate or not relate as a result of having to be far away from each other as we sort of come to a kind of more cultural consciousness around how disability affects us all. Like, there right. are all these avenues that it is both that kind of... Uh, thing we love to, to enjoy and, and find pleasure in, but also the thing that we have to, in some ways, critique and hate in some ways, because right. it becomes the mode through which we read things. And so we've got a, a little bit more time for some last questions. Here's a question um, that's taking us a different direction. So we've been talking about eating the rich, we're talking about technology and stuff. The question here is, um, oh, uh, what about representations of poverty in pop media, right? Yeah. Um, and I, I'll give a little bit more context to that question, which is we were talking a little bit earlier about kinds of how we love to hate these kinds of shows, or at least I love to hate these yeah. kinds of shows. You watch and you're like, ooh, oh, these people are so terrible and yeah, I'm yeah. so good. I am such a good person, <laughs> right? Um, but that kind of sometimes, sometimes can lead us to do nothing with that emotion, right? We feel good in that moment and it's a release, almost like a, um, a way that any sort of actual solidarity or momentum that, or movement building that we might build around a kind of actual rage at wealth um, becomes um, released in our homes when we're watching our TV show and then we don't do anything on the street. So 
the question here is, what about representation of poverty? Would that be a way to help maybe activate folks towards um, kind of horizons of either um, protests or to horizons of um, destruction of property that we think that should not exist or, you know, ensuring that land back is a thing? Like, are there ways that representations of other forms of life, which might also enrage right. us, but actually move us, is there ways that we can envision that being a kind of avenue forward? Well, I think that the same thing like, I'm always like, I would love to see just a million movies about eco-terrorism so that we can all start oh. talking about it more. But it's like, but I also think that the same is like true about, you can make the same mistake with mm. representation of any sort of othered group, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like people can yeah. watch it and be like, ah, I've eaten my vegetables, right? Like I've mm -hmm. done, like I'm, I've read a book by a black author, you know? Like it's mm -hmm. like, there, there's like often that tone of sort of it's, it's entirely related to the lazy feeling of satisfaction that we yes. get by being like, ah, uh, like, I'm a good person because I had this feeling when I watched this thing. Like, I'm a good person when I, because I watched Green Book and felt empathy towards the chauffeur. Like, right? Like, it's that, it's that like, classic vibe. And I think the same could be true about, mm -hmm. like, I, I, I mm -hmm. think there should be much more representation of poverty. And, and you know, where I think this is mm -hmm. like a, where I feel like... N completely unequivocal about this is yeah. just about journalism. Like I like Barbara Ehrenreich talked about this all the time, yeah. which was like people used to cover this cover strikes from the point of view of the strikers. Mm -hmm. It's now in America at least almost exclusively mm -hmm. from the point of view of the people who are inconvenienced by strikes. Like poor people have really, really, really disappeared from journalism. Yes. There is no like there are very few working class journalists. Mm -hmm. There are very mm -hmm. few working class people who could ever get into journalism right mm -hmm. now. And as a result of all these things and, you know, the attrition of journalism in general, and also just this general ideology, like, mm -hmm. you never see coverage, I mean, not never, obviously not never, mm -hmm. but so much journalistic coverage, like, is just celebrity yes. and, mm -hmm. and rich people drama, and mm -hmm. there is so little, um, like, like that, it's like we mm -hmm. absolutely need representation of that. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, I think like, like part of why, like I, I love, I, I feel an affection. These, these things are so easy to watch. It's so easy to watch people mm -hmm. in beautiful settings mm -hmm. with dumbass problems, right? Oh, they're it's so, so dumb, and I love it. It's so easy to watch. I it's so it. soothing, mm -hmm. you know. It's it's tougher to, it's tougher to like, end a tiring day, yeah. and watch something that relates to a part of life. Mm -hmm. That maybe you have spent all day worrying about that you've been, that, that your work is, you know, involved in, you know, it's like, it's, it's like, I understand why, like, li like, I, it sort of feels like life has gotten structurally worse. Mm -hmm. And so TV has gotten to be more of like a, you know, Wally type, like milkshake, mm -hmm. like scoot around the, the spaceship kind of thing. Yeah. Like, I think, um. I think there's a more of like a palliative effect yeah. that, it, that it like kind of almost needs to have right now. Um, but yeah, I think I'm like, I think as a beginning step to anything, it would be great if people were like, if development executives were bold enough to green light something that wasn't about a rich white person every yeah. now and again. I mean, I would watch a TV show of how to blow up a pipeline. I know the movie yeah. came out, but I would watch a TV show on that. Like, yeah. give me that. Like, totally. That would be totally dope. Or like a really good heist movie that's like, Here's how we're going to infiltrate. The people that actually fucking need the money. <laughs> I know, I know, exactly. You know, I, I would watch a reality TV show that's like, we're actually going to go and take money from banks and give it yeah, to Yeah, that's a great idea. I, I would, I yeah, would yeah, watch yeah. that. Reality heist. Would that's the show get incredible. past one season? Probably not. Everyone involved in that's that show would somehow get. That's actually a good idea. Reality but show of Ocean's know, Eleven. Listen, like everyone, anybody out here is a producer. The brilliant idea. I am willing to be a consultant uh, for this imaginary show that I'm envisioning for us. But it's um, like, yeah, I mean, you know, we, there's Squid Game and then there was Squid Game, and the reality Squid, show. Yeah. yeah and it's like, like, you totally missed the point. Yeah, yeah. Totally missed the point. Yeah. Okay, so we've got our last question for the night. Um, and here's the question. So we talked about current depictions of the ultra wealthy. Where do you see that kind of fiction going in the future? Um, for us, will this be the kind of story that we continue seeing for the next several years, considering the kinds of political um, uh, context that we're in? Or do you see actually a new figure emerging that we begin to um, love to sympathize and also love to hate in some ways? Are we going to just always be on the wealthy, eating, thinking about eating the rich as a kind of mm -hmm. passive thing? Or is there going to be a new figure that emerges soon? Well, I think the figure of the traitor <laughs> is mm. going to become like, you know, the, the, the Ripley type, the salt burn, oh, yes. whatever. Like, yeah. I think the figure of the traitor will become like a bigger feature. And like, I don't think we're going to, you know, people 
like, what do people probably want to turn on at the end of, like, like especially post-strike TV and movies are yeah. really like, what's going to make the most eyeballs? You know, mm. it's like, there's a bit of a, a sort of, we're pulling back the sort of risk-taking, mm -hmm. you know, art, the, the artistic ideals. Like, it's, I, I don't think that this is going away. I yeah. think the figure of the traitor will become, will become much greater. I, but I also... Yeah, I think that, I think also, I mean, we haven't even begun to talk about the way reality TV figures into oh. all of this. Oh, it's the whole know, thing, it's selling like, like, sunset? Yeah, oh, Real Housewives stuff, like it's, it's like, it's, um, mm -hmm. like the, that genre is also mm -hmm. sort of gawking at mm -hmm. the ultra wealthy, and I think, I think it will just, I think it will continue to be yeah. this for a while. Like, I really do think, like, I have, as, I have as much faith in when this will break as I do in income inequality itself. Yeah. Like, you know, the, whenever we finally elect a socialist president in the United States in two decades, you mm -hmm. know, we'll, we'll probably be, I don't yeah. know, like, about the time, I don't know. It yeah. won't, like, there, it won't be, like, knives out, white lotus, whatever, whatever, forever, but... But watching rich people on TV, like, yeah. like the, what scares me is the fact that what if the class war angle just disappears and it's just... It's just you know? watching. Like, Scotiabank um, produces the, like, I don't know, uh, remake of Succession 20 years down the line. Because but they're all having an amazing show. time. They're having a great time, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Who knows? Yeah. We'll, see. well, thank you so much, Gia. This was so wonderful. Thank you so much for talking uh, to me. Thank you, guys. I want to anything here. last things you want to offer to the audience before we wrap this up? No, thank you for, thank you for spending your night doing this. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very much so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, as we wrap up, uh, I'd like to say thank you again to the Phil Lind Initiative and to Phil Lind himself, who generously made tonight possible. Um, a big thank you as well to the wonderful staff of the SBPGA, uh, the Alumni and Development, and of course the Chan Center, uh, who worked tirelessly to make this happen. And all of your work is not only necessary, but so deeply appreciated. Um, and last but not least, thank you all to the audience. Um, it's been really fun. I've been enjoying the laughter. I've been enjoying the groans and the moans. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing you all again here on February 15th, when we welcome Suleika Draoud and John Batiste. And I hope you all have a wonderful night and go watch some succession, okay? <laughs>